Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's educational webinar with Cancer Support Community Los Angeles. I am Kathy Riley, the Associate Director of Programs at CSCLA, and I am honored to welcome you to this week's webinar titled At Your Cervix, How the Pap Smear Helps Prevent and Detect Cancer. And before we get started, if this is your first time joining us, Cancer Support Community Los Angeles uh, is a nonprofit organization providing vital social and emotional support to families facing cancer, including patients and caregivers and their loved ones, all at no cost. And our programs include support groups, healthy lifestyle classes, social activities, and educational programs such as this one. If you would like to learn more about our services or watch past webinars, you can visit our website at cancersupportla.org. And before I introduce uh, today's speaker, please note that your video and microphone are automatically disabled for this webinar, but we encourage you to enter questions into the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window at any time, and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We may not be able to get to all of your questions today, but we'll get to as many as possible. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Mona Guao is a gynecologic oncologist and assistant professor at Keck Medicine of USC, who specializes on treating all forms of gynecologic cancer, such as ovarian, uterine, and cervical cancers. Her research interests focus on strategies to enhance patient and provider interactions. Gives me great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Mona Guao. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kathy. Thank you guys all for having me here. Um, as, let me share my screen. Just practice this. All right. So as Kathy mentioned, we'll be talking about cervical cancer because this is um, January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. And it is really the only preventable gynecologic cancer that is out there, one of the few preventable um, cancers that uh, we deal with. And knowing a little bit more about it and how those mechanisms of prevention and detection is useful, not just for our cancer patients, but also their family, friends, um, and for our public health. So I'm gonna go through a couple of slides and I know a bunch of you have sent in questions and we'll hopefully go over them at the end, but I hope to answer a lot of them through these slides as well. So this is our agenda. We're gonna go over a little of the background, then screening and early detection, as well as what to do about abnormal results, and then um, touch on how the vaccine or the HPV vaccine is able to help prevent cervical cancer. So I'd like to preface um, these talks just with a review of our anatomy. Um, you guys are all a little bit more in tune with your bodies than the general population and probably know the human anatomy a little bit better. But I feel like our gynecologic organs are often overlooked and under, under misunderstood or under understood. So down here, this is a woman's body. Um, you can see uh, my pointer to highlight. So head is up there arms and legs, breasts, lungs are up top. This is your liver, stomach, large intestine, and small intestine. Down way below here is where your gynecologic uh, and urologic organs sit. So the bladder, the uterus, which sits behind the bladder, ovaries and, oh, I'm going back there, ovaries and fallopian tubes, which are there on the side. This is all within the pelvis. Here's your pelvic bone, your pubic bone in the front, and your pelvic girdle. Looking at, at from the side view and taking away the intestines, your uterus kind of sits right on top of your bladder in between the colon and rectum and the bladder. The ovaries sit on the side. And then this tube that's connecting the kidneys is the ureter. 
this way of looking at it, I think best shows us how gynecologic organs, the symptoms that come with it really affect the surrounding structures. So your bladder, your rectum, and your colon, as well as potentially causing back pain if you have issues with um, your uterus or your cervix because it's affecting the ureter, this connection to the kidneys. Another view, these are the schematics that you usually see in textbooks or in flyers. So again, you have your uterus up here, the endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus, which bleeds every month with periods and where a, um, a fetus would grow. You have your fallopian tubes, your ovaries, cervix is the opening of the uterus and what opens with childbirth and um, the vagina and vulva is on the outside. So again, the cervix is right here. Um, pap smears are done right here. When we examine you and look at inside the vagina, really the only thing we're able to see is the cervix. We're not able to see the uterus or any of the other organs. Okay, so we're gonna go a little bit of a background just on cervical cancer. This cancer often occurs in younger women, so premenopausal women um, between the ages of 30 and mid 50s. But precancerous lesions, that's what pap smears detect, often occur uh, about a decade earlier. It is almost always caused by this human papilloma virus or HPV. Probably 99% if not more of cervical cancers are caused by HPV. Risks for having cervical cancer include mostly risks of having bad immune system, whether that's taking immunosuppressive medicines because you have um, a transplant and you need to take those immuno immunosuppressive meds, you have HIV, or do things that decrease your immune system, such as smoking. History of active treatment for cancers, specifically the ones that really suppress your immune system, can also increase your risk of cervical cancer. Now, a little bit more about what exactly HPV is. It's called the human papilloma virus. And the word papilloma is in there because most of these viruses cause warts. So whether on your finger, on your legs, those little warts are almost all, always caused by this HPV virus. There's about 50 of them that are transmitted sexually and like to grow on sexual or mucosal um, areas. They're not considered a STI or a STD in the common way that we use that word, like chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV or syphilis. And that's partly because um, almost everyone will be exposed to this virus, just like the common cold virus or RSV, uh, you, it's part of our daily environment. And so um, people can get it even without intercourse if there is just exposure to the genitals. There are about 14 high risk types. And it's important to note that both men and women get cancer with HPV. Um, the vast majority of the cancers that we see are cervical cancers or precancers. But at the bottom of this, of this um, iceberg, you have head and neck cancers, so oropharyngeal, anal cancers, vulvovaginal cancers, and penile cancers, all which are uh, mostly caused by this virus. The specific strain is 16 and 18. Those cause about 70% of cancers. And again, I think this point of HPV being uh, important for both men and women is really a, a, one of the take home points because it does not just affect women. An infection, if you just test the general population, about 45% of men, so actually a little bit higher number of men than women will have the virus. So 45% of men ages 18 to 60 will have this virus and 40% of them will have it. Um, but most of the time it's just like being exposed to any viruses in the environment, it doesn't cause any issues. So why does it cause cancer and how does it cause cancer? So those little blue dots you can, um, are the virus and the square parts are the cells of your cervix or of anywhere else, head and neck or the anus. When you have an HPV infection, um, most of the time, like I said before, the body ends up clearing that infection because of our own natural immune system. 
However, certain high-risk HPVs, such as 1618, can linger in the cells of the cervix. The virus has proteins inside that disrupt the normal growth and, and um, division of cells, which ends up making these cells abnormal or causing what's called dysplasia. These abnormal cells are the precancerous cells, and that's what's detected usually by pap smears. They're not cancer yet, but if they're left in this state of precancer, in this state of abnormality and dysplasia, they have the potential to transform into cervical cancer over many years, um, sometimes decades. So the good news is that our body can often, during this time of dysplasia, can often send up warning signs through pap smears that there is abnormalities happening. And um, when we can detect them, then we can do treatment before things become cancer. HPV infection alone is not enough to cause cervical cancer. Other things like we mentioned before, like smoking or weakened immune system or genetic predisposition can make it easier for the infection or the viruses to go into the cells, for the cells to divide ab abnormally, or for the body to not clear those viruses. And so it's a, it's a really a complex puzzle with multiple pieces that need to fall into place for cancer to develop. Our immune systems are very powerful, which is why even if you've had HPV in the past, your body most likely would have cleared it, um, even if it's high risk. So most people with HPV never develop cervical cancer. Back in the 50s, cervical cancer was the most common cause of death in the US for women. Now it's still um, really prevalent uh, across the world. It's still the number four cause of death for women uh, globally, mostly in low and middle income countries. But in the 1980s is about when we started screening for uh, cervical cancer via pap smears. That's when the technology for cytology and pap smears was developed. And then in the 2010s was about when the HPV vaccine was, was developed and then starting to get rolled out to the general population. And so you can see these decreases in cervical cancer um, rates after those interventions started. So now we're gonna move on to what the pap smear is. Okay, so um, I'm sure people have had pelvic exams and pap smears, but I'd like to just take a moment to go over what exactly is entailed in both of them because a pelvic exam doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get a pap smear. This is the, the lovely um, stirrups and the foot rests that I call them when patients get examined. You're sitting up there, they're asking you to scooch down as far as humanly possible until you're falling off of the bed. And your uh, gynecologist is gonna look in between your in between um, your legs to your vagina and look inside. Most of a pelvic exam or most pelvic exams include this pelvic or bimanual exams where a provider will take a feel of your organs because like I mentioned earlier, you can't see the uterus, the ovaries, you can only see the cervix. And so by putting one hand within the vagina and then one hand on top of the belly, you're able to kind of capture the pelvic organs in between both of these hands to take a feel of what, what is there. This can help feel for um, enlarged uteruses, enlarged ovaries, tenderness, um, if someone were to have an infection. And if there were cancer on the cervix, this is really important to figure out what the stage of the, of the cancer is. We're not gonna be getting too much into cervical cancer specifically, but um, this exam is part of the, uh, it's one of the few cancers where we need a physical exam to determine your stage. Uh, a speculum exam is separate from a bimanual or a pelvic exam. So this is a metal speculum. I actually have a plastic speculum here with me as well. Um, they're the exact, they do the exact same things. Um, one is obviously disposable, the metal one is not, they have their pros and cons. The metal one warms up faster, so it's often more comfortable and it's not as squeaky as that of the, um, the plastic ones. But what it does, and you're, if this is your vagina, your, the speculum goes in so that we can push open the vaginal walls and be able to see that cervix at the end of the vagina. Here's a representation of that with the speculum coming in. 
so that you can see your cervix, be able to see the entire cir circle of it, and then be able to collect that pap smear. You need a speculum exam if you're looking for anything and also to do um, some of the SDI or STD screenings, such as chlamydia or gonorrhea tests, tests for bacterial vaginosis, for yeast infections, et cetera. But just doing this also doesn't mean that you're getting a pap smear. So you have to be really clear with your provider when you get that pap smear, if you're getting a pap smear or not. So now the pap smear specifically. So it is, um, it's called a smear because it used to be that we uh, took the sample from the cervix and then put it on a slide, a glass slide like that you see in the, um, the old school microscopes with glass slides. You smear it on there and you take a look under the microscope. Now, most pap smears are done um, via what's called cytology, which means it's sent off for pathologists to look at in, um, in liquid. And so the pap smear can both test for the presence of the virus, but also any abnormal cells. This is what you typically see now. This little container is the thin prep. It's what we often use, what most of the US uses for uh, pap smears. You will see three, set, three other instruments, two or three other instruments that your providers might use. And I have them here. Some people just use this little um, uh, brush. And the brush goes into the cervix and collects the cells. It's really soft. Um, and it feels like people who have had it, like someone's pressure, putting pressure um, deep inside. The other two things are a spatula and um, a smaller brush called a cyto brush. The spatula just goes like that picture over there in number two, it scrapes off some of the cells into um, the, from the cervix and then you put it into that little cup there, which is the fluid that preserves the cells. And then you have this little brush, which is, looks like a little mascara brush, but that goes in there and scrapes off the inside of the cervical cells because the cervix in the average woman is about four centimeters. And so while most of these cervical um, cancers happen right on the outside here, some of them can be hidden like a centimeter in, in between or inside, um, which is why this extra brush and that additional scraping on the inside is necessary. Takes about a minute, less than that, 10 seconds or so to get that done. Most of the time with a pap smear, the difficulty is finding the cervix, which means because our vagina is not open, it's closed. And so in order to put in your speculum and look for where that cervix is, that often takes some maneuvering from your providers um, to get it in the right location. At any time, you can ask someone to say, hey, this is uncomfortable, stop, give me a minute and have and redo it. Because it's not like this is a, a procedure where you have to do step by step or else it doesn't work. Again, pelvic exam doesn't necessarily mean a pap smear. And this is really important because when, um, when we see patients, when I see patients, um, a lot of them say, hey, I." get an exam every year, they must be doing a pap smear every, every year. Or I got an exam in the emergency room when I went there for uh, bleeding. And so I got my pap smear then, but that's not the case. Pap smears are almost always only done in the office. So with a family, your family doctor, your primary care doctor, or your gynecologist, um, almost never in the hospital or in an emergency room or urgent care situation. How often do I need this? And this is um, the caveat here is that these recommendations are for the United States. They are different in other countries, both when you start as well as when you, um, how frequently you get them. So in the US, most up-to-date recommendations are that pap smears start being done at 21 years old, regardless of your previous sexual history, regardless of your medical history. Um, Screening for cervical cancer starts at 21. And the main reason is that for younger women, immune systems are just more robust and we're more likely to detect something and then end up treating something that doesn't need to be treated because the immune system will, will have gotten rid of this virus or those abnormal cells by themselves. So between ages of 21 to 29, you could do a pap smear every three years. 
after the age of 25 is when we add this HPV test, which is called co-testing, um, to the pap smear. Again, the pap smear is looking at the cells. HPV is just testing for the presence of that virus or not, and then the type of the virus. The reason we don't start HPV tests before age 25 is, again, the same reason why we don't test do pap smears for age under 21. Your immune system is great, and you are likely to clear that virus by yourself. After age 30, we space out um, testing pap smears. If you, well, we space out testing with pap, with pap smears and HPV testing, so this coast testing to every five years. You can also keep on doing pap smears just by themselves every three or HPV test by itself every five. And you can just tell by these recommendations that these new guidelines are really because of um, how much we have learned about HPV and that HPV is the main cause of cervical cancer. So if you do not have HPV and you had a correct test and a good test, the chance of you developing cancer is exceedingly low. After 65, if you've gotten routine screenings, so you have gotten normal pap smears, either three normal paps or two normal co-tests at a regular interval in the past, um, and you don't have a history of a very abnormal or high-grade precancer pap, then you can stop pap smears. Same with if you've had a hysterectomy, but that hysterectomy has to be a total hysterectomy where your cervix is also removed. People can sometimes have supracervical hysterectomies or subtotal hysterectomies. Um, supracervical means that only the top of the, so over here, only the top of the uterus, only the uterus was removed and the cervix remains. Subtotal can mean different things. Sometimes it just means keeping the ovaries and fallopian tubes. Sometimes it means keeping the cervix. So if you've had a hysterectomy, it's important to figure out what type you've had. But if you've had your hip, your cervix removed um, and you had a hysterectomy and you are say 40, then if you've had normal pap screening in the past, the past 10 years or so, then you're good. You treat you as the same as if you were to have um, to be more than, to be over 65. After 65, we stop, but it's, again, with, like, with many things in medicine, it can still be a conversation between you and your, um, your provider with what your individual risks are. So in those special cases, if you have had a prior high-grade dysplasia, and those are SIN2 or SIN3, which we'll go over in a, in a little bit, um, then you have to continue testing on that regular schedule for at least 25 years after this diagnosis, which can be, um, and often is, after 65. If you have HIV or bad immune system, I'm sorry, this is actually a little bit wrong, you have to start with yearly PAPs until you've had three negative yearly PAPs, and then you can move on to every three years with co-testing. Um, and But still, you start at age 21. Don't need to start earlier. Um, and some we mentioned this earlier as well, your sexual history, family history of cancers, your vaccination history all do not matter with these guidelines. Um, the number of sexual partners, um, any of that stuff doesn't affect when you start testing. This little image here is an example of high grade dysplasia. So over these pink cells over here are normal cervical cells. And this clump of, well, really is just nuclei. So these, this clump of cells right here doesn't have that nice pink surrounding. And so this is a high grade clump of, um, of dysplasia that isn't cancer. Okay. So moving on to the different PAP results that you can have. Um, or you can see on your reports. Most common, the thing we like to see most is this nil or nil M. So it's negative for an intraepithelial lesion or malignancy. And intraepithelial just means within the cells of the, um, of the, like within skin cells or within those cervical cells. Ask us. Is one of the more frustrating ones, as with all of these ones that have uncertain significance afterwards, 
it um, means that we just don't know. It could be due to many things, uh, often not due to anything to do with cancer or precancer, but the uh, pathologist or the person reading it is not able to say for sure that it's normal. And squamous cells, squamous cells are the same, mostly that you can see, think of them as the same as epithelial cells. They're just a type of, um, a type of cell that you see on the cervix. Then you could get either low or high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. So that's the SIL and then low and high grade. Um, the reason I put an asterisk here is because there's a specific type of ASCA cells that are ASCH. These are more concerning than ask us because they're bordering, they're atypical. They don't meet quite meet their pathological definitions of what constitute high grade abnormality, but it's abnormal enough that they can't, they don't feel comfortable just cause, causing it, calling it uncertain significance. Then you have atypical glandular cells. And the key here is that we have squamous here and glandular here. Usually the cervix doesn't have that many glandular cells. And so when we see these atypical glands, we're thinking this could be coming from something in the endometrium or from the uterus, something higher above that's getting captured when you're doing your pap smear, or it's a deeper lesion. Remember the cervix is four centimeters. The outside of the cervix is mostly those squamous cells and where we do the pap smear, but deeper on the inside of the cervix um, is where the, those glands can be. And then this is not really connected, it's almost separate because you can have any of these reads with this read, a high risk HPV present. Um, depending on the test, they can tell you if this HPV is one of the um, specific types like 16, 18, 45, or they say other. You remember there's about 40 to 50 high risk strains. So they often don't specify which one of those exact ones it is. Since 70% of cervical cancers are caused by just these two, and then another like 10 to 15 is caused by 45. As you can imagine, if you um, ignore the, high, the HPV thing, these four slash five can be very subjective. And so pap smears are a, a pathologist or a person looking at it and deciding whether these cells look normal or not. And that's also part of the reason why people have do, have started doing HPV tests for everything, because this is more objective. Like you either have this virus or you don't. Talk a little bit about these abnormal cells, um, just because that these are the ones that we really act on and do something about. Here's just a schematic, like a cartoon of what um, your cells can look like. Cervical cells that are completely normal, they're nice and organized, like there's layers to here. Low grade cells, they get a little bit bigger, look a little bit abnormal, but they're still pretty organized in, um, in some fashion. Then you move on to this high grade and it's starting to look like things are fighting to come up towards the, the top of the cervix here. The cells are bigger, they're looking more a little darker, a little bit more ugly, um, but not, they haven't broken the, it's called the basement membrane, but they haven't broken that uh, divide between cervix and something else. Because when you invade it into another tissue, that's when, or invade it into the, the beyond where you were before, that's when cancer happens. And so the next step here is H cell to cervical cancer. The reason there are these arrows here is because um, cervical cancer does not go back, but any of these abnormalities can regress. They can get better um, or they can get worse depending on all of those other factors that we talked about in the past. Other words here, dysplasia, no dysplasia, l cell is mild, h cell is moderate or severe, and then you have cancer, and then the SIN. So you have SIN stands for, and I should have written this out, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Um, then one, it's just the grading of one, two, and three until cancer. One equals low grade or mild dysplasia. Two and three are moderate and severe or high grade dysplasia.
So if you do have an abnormal pap smear, that's anything that doesn't isn't that NIL. So ASCUS, LCIL, HCIL, AGC, ASCH, any of those things. It could just mean nothing. Some hormonal changes or infections or even um, like vaginal douching products, sperm often, they can affect the pap smear and affect how it's read because anything anything can affect our, our, our like skin cells. So things can affect our cervical cells. Usually this is those L-cell or ASCUS um, pap smears could mean nothing. And in that case, we would often just repeat, like have the, if, if say you had used a kind of infection like BV and you needed to be treated, then you could come back and do it again. Or if you had, um, were using certain products around that time, um, to stop and then get it done. Most often, um, it just means repeating the test. So instead of waiting three years or six or five years to repeat the test, you do again in six months or one year. Six months usually is if you're only doing the pap smear and one year if you're doing a pap smear with HPV testing or that co-test. These next two are more procedure-based. When you have um, H cell, so the higher grade, or ask H, or those high grade or high risk HPV 16, 18, usually recommend that we do this procedure called colposcopy, which means looking closer to better examine the cervix. And also move on to treatments, which means taking out that piece of cervix. So I'm gonna go over these two a little bit more in detail. Colposcopy, it's a word that many people haven't heard of, but really all it means is looking at the cervix. The copal is your cervix. Oscopy is like a, a, um, a scope or looking under a microscope. And so your provider will use this special camera, uh, special microscope really, to uh, look at the cells, look at the cervix specifically and see if there's abnormal cells. They usually put vinegar, and this is vinegar that you get over the like in in Walmart um, on the cells because abnormal cells do not take up as much vinegar and it looks more white under the microscope. Then they can take biopsies of the cervix that give pathologists a little bit more tissue to look at to tell you exactly how abnormal those cells are. If those are really high grade cells or you can't really tell, or if you have persistent low-grade cells, we would recommend then going on to treatment. And treatment means taking out that portion of abnormal cervix. You might have heard a whole bunch of words in relation to this. LEAP is a loop electrocautery uh, procedure, excisional procedure, which means taking this little wire and using heat to burn off a chunk of the cervix where the abnormal cells are. Code knife cone is taking a scalpel and cutting out that cervix. Laser, I don't know what this is, but laser is, as you imagine, it's a laser that goes in and burns off the abnormal cells. And then cryotherapy is using cold to similarly burn off those cells. Um, most places now don't do cryotherapy, but there are still some places that have that machine capability. So I'd say the most common treatment that you see in the out in um, uh, in gynecology offices are LEAP and cold neck cones. LEAPs can be done in the office. You come in to your uh, GYN, your gynecologist's office, and they prepare you to do it just the same day, and then you go home. Cold neck cones are done in the operating room, and that's because they're just using a scalpel, so we need to make sure that, the, that you do not move at all and you get anesthesia with it. And you do get a little bit more tissue off with the cold knife, the cold knife comb. What these procedures do by taking out that cervix, you're not only taking out what we think is the abnormal cells, but also causing an immune reaction in your cervix. So it's like any injury that you have anywhere else. If you have a cut, now your body is coming over there with more blood and more um, white blood cells, more um, uh, immune cells to try to repair that cut and prevent any infections from getting into that cut. So by doing this excision on the cervix, 
We similarly cause your body to collect all of your, to, to basically cause an increased immune reaction to then hopefully kill any remaining virus that is there. Um, and then moving on to what exactly this HPV vaccine does and why we use it. In general, vaccines are used to teach your immune system to recognize a virus and then create your own antibodies, which are your own soldiers to fight it. So if you remember from those that previous picture a couple of slides, a few slides ago, blue thing is a virus. When we encounter a virus, our body produces little antibodies that then identify them. They're like the sentries and then get um, the rest of the, the army of immune cells to come and destroy the virus. With a vaccine, it has pieces of this. Um, it gives you pieces of this virus, but not the actual virus so that your body can recognize it, produce these sentries, and then um, the next time you do see the virus, they're able to come and kind of kill off all of the viruses that come. And so we recommend doing vaccines before you actually get exposed to the actual virus itself. So because by doing it afterwards, you're not able to then fight off the ones you just, you already had. The way that our Gardasil or like the HPV vaccines work is that it gives pieces of a number of different types of those high risk viruses. For Gardasil it's nine and we'll, I'll show you next slide with it. And then other places it can be 13, it can be three. Um, and then by giving those little chunks of viruses, your body sees them, creates these antibodies. And then the next time you are exposed to them, it is able to fight them off. So there's different versions in different countries, but in the US it's Gardasil 9. It has protections against the seven most high risk strains, so six, including 16 and 18, which are the ones that cause 70% of cancers, and then two lower risk types that cause warts. It is the only one that's available in the US, um, and it's the one that's um, uh, recommended for all ages. There was a study, there's been multiple studies looking at how the HPV vaccine works and well, whether it works. This was one of them where they vaccinated um, you know, more than 8,000 girls with the vaccine as well as with a placebo, which just means a um, uh, with sugar water basically. And then they followed them for four years. After four years, only two girls in that HPV vaccinated group had developed dysplasia, whereas more than 100 girls in that other, other group developed dysplasia. Again, these are small numbers, two out of 8,000 and 100 out of 8,000. But the risk reduction, the decrease in your risk is substantial. And this is the same pattern that's been shown in multiple, um, in multiple studies worldwide. In Australia, particularly because HPV also causes genital warts, they also found that the amount of genital, genital warts went down also in men who weren't being vaccinated um, in general, like their population amount of warts just decreased for men and women. Part of that is something you call, heard, probably heard of, especially with the recent um, pandemic is herd immunity. So if you're taking out the virus and the uh, infection from more people in the community than the people who aren't vaccinated or can't be vaccinated are also protected. So this is the one in the U.S. and these recommendations are just for the U.S. so it's different in Canada and Australia and the U.K. but here we recommend that everyone men and women are vaccinated between ages 9 to 26. Ideally at age 11 to 12 because again the earlier the vaccination the more effective it is because you want to catch someone before they are exposed to any of these viruses. Recently, I think in the past two years, two or three years, FDA has approved um, the vaccine for patients up to age 46. So even if you've had a history of HPV or had dysplasia, this is still could be helpful because it's helping you prevent infection with any of the other strains. Part of this reason is also just because um, where 
a more sexually active community in general now. And so people are not monogamous by age 30. They're not married by age 30. And so there's more exposures. And so there's also data that shows that giving it later is still able to help decrease um, dysplasia and cancer for the, for the older population. So then what, what can you do? We kind of went over everything that you, you can do to prevent cervical cancer. The main one is, is vaccinate. Um, that's the best thing you can do to help decrease your chance. Regular pap smears to be able to catch those cancer cells early and treat them. Have your family and friends to do those same things. And then specifically for cervical cancer and for other things to stop smoking um, to help improve your immune system. And I think, oh, one more slide. So most cervical cancer is preventable with screening and the HPV vaccine. Um, drawing back to the my first, first slide and the first things we talked about, this is the only gynecologic cancer that is preventable uh, with screening. The only thing we have screening for, and it works. Our cervical cancer rates have decreased um, uh, over the world, and especially in the US. And if we can get rid of it completely, I mean, that would be a amazing boom. Great resource for cervical cancer or for any gynecological cancers is foundationforwomenscancer.org. They are a subsidiary of the Society of Gynecologic Oncology, which is our so medical society for um, women who take care of women with cancers, uh, w w women with female cancers. So you have um, information on all the different cancer types, and they have really good educational materials. A lot of the pictures I have here were taken from them. They also have a um, uh, a little, they're revamping this, but they have a map where you can search for specific cancer doctors around um, the, the country, really. And this is when I put in Cancer Support Community LA. This, these are the whole bunch of people who popped up. And it has their numbers and I think just some information about the oncologist in there. All right, thank you. I hope I answered some questions um, and then we'll go over some other ones. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Guao. We um, so appreciate that informative and a meaningful presentation. I uh, just personally learned so much. Uh, so thank you for presenting uh, to our community and sharing your expertise with us. I invite everyone uh, to put any questions you have into the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, we've already received one and then some from registration, so uh, we can start with those, but, but we've got about 10 minutes for a question, so please feel free to, uh, to add any questions that you, that you have. Uh, the first question is if someone is, um, 65 and older and has had three normal pap smears, um, do they still need to do um, a pelvic uh, exam? Do you recommend that? It's a good question. Um, after pelvic exams in general are more useful when you have a concern. So I think talk with your doctor about this, but if you don't have any other gynecologic issues, like you don't have any vulvar issues or like lesions, moles, warts that they need to keep on following. If you don't have any symptoms, I don't think a second one exam is really that helpful. But symptoms can include things like vaginal dryness, pain with sex or intercourse, even some urinary symptoms, like in those cases, um, exams would be necessary, but routine is probably not. And then could you talk a little more about up to what age you can receive the HPV vaccine? Um, because the, I think one of the last slides you shared uh, talked about uh, a little bit older age cap on the recommendations. And um, so can you, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about sort of the upper end of the recommended um, age recommendations for the HPV vaccine? So it's a blanket um, uh, approval for up to age 46. So if you haven't had the vaccination, um, it you can talk to your gynecologist or your family, or your uh, PCP about it. 
the only, I think, caveat there is that it might not be covered by all insurances. And so um, one of the ways that we're able to get people um, the vaccine is if you have a history of dysplasia or have other high risk, um, high risk things that make you more susceptible to developing HPV or developing um, uh, cervical cancer, then you can make a case that this is gonna be beneficial and for your insurance to cover it. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question that came into um, the Q&A and maybe you can, um see it, Dr. Guao, but um, I want to make sure I understand the question. Uh, could incontinence be a consequence of, um, it says, uterus problem? Um, I see what she's, this is um, urethra. Okay. Uh, either urethra or uterus. You can type and say which, which one it is. The urethra is the, um, the tube that is the opening to the bladder, and so that runs right above the vagina. And the um, uterus is, is the uterus above the cervix. Incontinence could be a, a whole bunch of reasons. Um, there's also different types of incontinence, like incontinence when you cough or sneeze and run versus incontinence as it just happens because you're, you can't make it to the bathroom in time um, or if your bladder is too full. So it really depends on what the, which type of incontinence you have. And some of them can be because of an issue with their urethra itself, Often it's a um, it's a reason of the muscles surrounding your bladder and your uterus, like your pelvic floor, which is why women after childbirth doesn't matter if it's a vaginal delivery or a C-section, we end up having bladder issues because our pelvic floor, those muscles are just stretched and unfortunately torn, and so you end up not having the same strength in your in your bladder. But that's and uh, a gynecologist should be able to help. Um, determine which one of those it is for a urologist. Uh, so uh, someone is um, asking about um, the the vaccine and um, uh, do you think if they're above that age limit and have a cancer diagnosis, is it still worth asking uh, for the vaccine because they're at higher risk? Um, we have not been able to get it for anyone above the age, unless I think someone pays completely out of pocket, um, because it's just not it's not covered. And, and part of that reason is um, that uh, after menopause, and um, as patients get older, your cervix is also less likely to take up to be a healthy place for viruses, and so you're less likely to get HPV um, viruses after that age, if you haven't already had it. Um, most people are also less likely to have new partners after that age, um, but that's that's something that's different for every person. But the the kind of that that age is that, that's the reason why that age was, was made because of typical risks and um, like people's, people's bodies and their cervical cells. Thank you for that. Um... So uh, someone is asking a question about this tension between, um, you know, in, whether or not insurances will, will um, you know, cover a pap smear uh, for an annual exam. Uh, if it's considered prevention, um, why are those not covered for annual um, exams or annual physicals? That's a good question. <laughs> and unfortunately, one that I cannot answer um, many questions about insurances. I mean, it just has to do with the bottom line and what is cost effective or not. And, you know, the most cost effective time to do a vaccine is when the person is 11 or 12. And so their thinking is probably that you, if you miss that period between nine and 26, you're now, there's no data, there, there's less data to show that it's cost effective that paying for that vaccine will end up saving money in the long run. And, you know, we could go, we have a whole talk and discussion about the difficulties of insurance companies and why they do what they do, but. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great information though. And then um, for someone who has, um, and I believe you covered this um, in your talk, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to come, come back to it because of some questions at registration. Uh, for someone with a family history of cervical cancer, 
in particular, do you recommend uh, pap smears more often than um, every three years? No, uh, just because most cervical cancer is caused by HPV. Um, so it's not a genetic reason for it. There are very rare cancers that are genetically, um, uh, that are genetically, um, word, passed on for cervical cancer. And those are, um, I think, so part of that is knowing what exactly the type of cancer your family member had and if they had genetic testing. Those are often also associated with a bunch of other cancers as well. So it's unusual that cervical cancer is the only cancer that's presenting, um, but those are exceedingly rare. And then um, we also had questions come in at registration um, a, a, about someone who um, is a survivor um, herself of ovarian and uterine and fallopian tube cancers. And how often should someone with that type of history, and, and you may have answered this in the previous question, uh, but how often uh, should someone uh, with that particular situation uh, receive a pap smear? Um, no, I think that's still a good question. Um, and part of that depends on what you have, what they did for your treatments. So most of the time for ovarian, fallopian tube, and uterine cancer, you end up taking out, doing a total hysterectomy as part of the treatment. So you end up not having a cervix. So as long as you have had regular screening beforehand and you uh, so like the, the two normal or two, more, two normal co-testing or three normal, normal pap smears before that, um, then you've had your hysterectomy and you don't need that anymore. If you haven't um, had regular pap smears beforehand, then part of it, I mean, having the cervix out means that they were able to take a look at the cervix and tell if there's any abnormalities to it. If for some reason you had a supra cervical, so they ended up not taking out your cervix because of difficulty or whatever, um, then you still need regular pap smears, not any more frequent than you would if you didn't have the cancer. Great, thank you. And then uh, one final um, question uh, for you, because I see we are ending, uh, the, the nearing the end of our time. And and I think this is a, an, along the lines of prevention, but also equipping you know all of us who are uh, watching the presentation today too, to, to spread the word. Um, but what, you know, what challenges are there with patients, getting patients to do regular pap smears? And uh, what have you seen um, as an effective way to, to communicate the importance of that to patients? And what, what can we do in the community to get the word out as well? Um, I think there's multiple layers of, of barriers for routine, just routine care, right? It's not just really about pap smears, but having someone be able to get care regularly with a, with any doctor. Um, you know, an easy thing from a medical side is to make sure that your primary care doctor is able to do pap smears and that they, if they're not asking you about it, that you bring it up. And if you only see a primary care doctor and you haven't gotten a pap smear, you ask them like, hey, do you do pap smears? Are you, like, am I up to date with it? Can you just check and make sure? And know yourself when your last pap smear was and have that information so that you, you know when you are due for it. Um, some of the things that we have that like are, are being done in the, um, in the cancer, the, the prevention community in general is doing self-tests for HPV. So instead of having people come in and getting a speculum exam, just doing a swab and testing just for the HPV vaccine or the HPV virus and not actually a, a full on pap smear because of how, again, all that data that HPV is the most main cause of it. And so that's a way to decrease that barrier of just need, needing to get in to do the pap smear. Um, and yeah, our, our system is unfortunately puts a lot of a lot of onus on the individual. So on the individual person and the patient themselves to make sure that these things are done we don't have, like in, in Canada, say where I'm from, you get letters from the government saying you're due for this. And so someone is checking up with you and making sure that, that 
at least they're reaching out. And even if it might take like eight months for you to get in, um, someone is, is help reminding you for that thing to be done. Um, here, it's, it's a lot of yourself doing something. And then after you get an abnormal to pap smear to make sure that you follow up and don't just kind of chalk it off to, oh, it's, it's fine, I just get it again next time. Um, if it's not normal, like know how abnormal it is and have collect that information yourself and make sure you have it. Yeah, I think that's um, such great advice to to conclude this with is to um, yeah self advocacy and and following up um, mm -hmm. is is such great advice for for all of us. Um, well, we have reached the end of our time together today and. I really uh, want to thank you again, Dr. Guao, for your time, for sharing your expertise uh, with us and engaging in this uh, great presentation and great conversation. And I want to thank our attendees for your engagement with us today and for your participation and thoughtful questions. If you would like to learn more about Cancer Support uh, Community LA, um, we're, we're typing uh, the website into the chat again as well. And um, and Dr. Guao may be able to share her slides from today. We're, we're checking on that. So if you would like a copy of those slides, please email us at info at cancersupportla.org and uh, we will let you know uh, when those are available. Um, thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful day, and we look forward to seeing you again at one of our upcoming webinars or workshops. Thank you.